Let me start with you first, Ralph. Uh, you heard my intro. Uh, give us what you saw as a kind of quick update of kind of where we are, uh, what tough options or tough things we face in this state budget. Yeah, I, I, I think if anyone paid attention to the governor's budget address, it's very clear what the problems are in Illinois. And, and they're not really the ones caused by COVID. Sure, the pandemic drove down revenue for our state. But our revenue hit's not going to be as bad as it could have been. We're not only getting the federal bailout, we had some pr surprisingly positive tax returns on the income tax, for instance. And so we will be able to cobble through that temporary hit to our revenue. Uh, our real problem is the structural problem. We, Illinois has for generations had what what people who do fiscal policy for a living call a structural deficit. And that just simply means if you start in the current fiscal year with a balanced budget and you project forward your revenue against your, your costs growth, what you'll see is your revenue growth will not keep pace with your cost growth uh, over time, even if no new program is added or expanded. So this is a picture of the projection of the structural deficit going forward in Illinois from fiscal year 2019 forward, if we started with a balanced budget in 2019, we did not. Uh, but, but if you look at this, what you clearly see is the state really doesn't have a revenue system in place that supports its current level of spending on services, plus its debt load. The, the red line shows you our projected growth in revenue, that very ugly yellow green line shows you our cost growth. Now, this structural deficit model our, my organization actually developed about 15, 18 years ago, and it's been independently peer reviewed by four different PhD economists. We've accurately predicted the growth in the state's deficit with this thing within 1% every single year. It's a pretty solid model. But what it really tells you is we can't afford our current level of spending on services, and that's a problem. Why? If you look at the FY22 budget proposal that Governor Pritzker did put on the table, you see we're going to spend about $27.7 billion on public services this year, virtually the exact same amount we spent last year. But flat funding that from year to year, to get to that point, the governor had to propose about $1.3 billion of one-time or recurring revenue enhancements for this fiscal year, involving everything from diverting money from the local government distributive fund, which goes to municipalities, diverting some capital revenue that would have come from some gas tax and some cigarette taxes away from capital programs and into the general fund budget, and eliminating about $932 million in corporate tax expenditures. If all the those things don't happen. The state of Illinois this year is going to have to cut that $27 billion in spending on services by at least $1.3 billion. And here's the problem with that. 96 cents out of every dollar the state of Illinois spends only goes to four things, education, healthcare, social services, and public safety. So Illinois literally has tax policy right now that doesn't support its current level ex of expenditures on education, health, social services, and public safety. It just doesn't. And it's going to get worse into the future. And our structural deficit does grow every year uh, by somewhere around a billion and a half to three billion, depending on the year. And unless we have some pretty substantial structural changes to our tax policy, we're really in a, in a very, very difficult place. So I'm not nearly as worried about COVID-19 as I am about this structural deficit and responding to it. And I'm gonna say two more things about the structural deficit. You know, we've had this mismatch between our revenue growth and our service cost growth in Illinois for decades, literally going back to the late 60s, early 70s. That's the first time the University of Illinois identified our state had a structural deficit. So for generations, because political leadership has lacked the will to, increase taxes to the point where we could support current services. That mismatch between revenue growth and cost growth has caused two bad things to happen in Illinois. Number one, the state of Illinois has for generations pushed the primary obligation to fund public education away from state tax revenue and down to local tax revenue. 
this is why property taxes are high. It, 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 the whole reason the state did this is because every year it didn't have quite enough revenue growth to cover the same level of services it provided the prior year just after adjusting for inflation. So a one way to continue funding services was to literally push this obligation down to local property taxes. So much so that today in Illinois, our state relies on property taxes more than any other state in school funding. Property taxes cover 67% of the cost of public education in our state. The national average is only 46%. Meanwhile, state taxes like the income and sales, et cetera, only cover about 25% of the cost of public education in Illinois. The national average is 46%. So we're the outlier in both cases. And, and this high property tax burden and reliance is a direct outcome of the structural deficit. The other direct well, outcome well, is the pension underfunding. Can I just uh, interrupt because of this a problem we're having? I want to be able to tell Tom, I'm constantly getting text people under the passcodes. I'm sending out another one right now. To everybody? Yeah. Okay. I, okay. Sorry, Ralph. Go ahead. No, David, it's okay. You know, I, you know, it's nice of you to mention the class I teach at Roosevelt. And for whatever reason, my Roosevelt Zoom account from me as a professor will not accept my camera on my computer and it just just no matter what I do and and it mutes me in the middle of talking to my classes so I've had some very entertaining classes uh, by via zoom and I'm trying to get my zoom issues worked out so not only are my feelings not hurt I'm kind of sympathetic and empathetic with your your pain so the other the other issue created by the structural deficit is the pension underfunding and uh, well we won't put up that slide yet Tom I'm just going to talk about it for a second Everyone thinks, and certainly the media repeats, the public employee pension benefits have driven this large underfunded system. There are no data that support that. There never have been data to support that. The reason the state has a huge, and it's now over $143 billion, unfunded liability, and when I say unfunded liability, what you should hear is debt, this debt that it owes to its pension system is for decades, the state simply didn't put into the pension systems what the actuary said should go in to fund the benefits being earned. They instead said, you know what? We have this structural deficit. We don't have enough money to fund schools and healthcare the same level we did last year. We're just gonna not put into the pensions what we should, give them an IOU that bears interest and take this money that should have gone to fund pensions and use it to hide the structural deficit and pays for some services. That's, that's literally using the pension systems like a credit card, right? And then in 1995, they passed this law called the pension ramp that was supposedly going to put the pensions on a path to health where they'd repay this debt. So they created a 50-year payment plan that was just so backloaded and so irresponsible that literally for the first 15 years of this legislation, they just codified the practice of underfunding the pension. And then they backloaded the repayments. It's called a ramp for a reason. It looks like a ski slope. They, they backloaded the payments so much that they grew on a year-to-year -year basis in ways that our state could never accommodate. So just from last fiscal year into this fiscal year, the debt service on the pension ramp grew by over $700 million by law. Our total revenue growth for the general fund on a year-to-year -year basis, if we didn't have COVID, et cetera, would be about $180 million. So you have, you have the pension debt service growing at like five times the rate of growth of your revenue from your tax policy. So those two big problems were caused by the structural deficit. And the third thing, and the most obvious thing, of course, is we can't continue to provide the same level of services we currently provide. And, and we're not a high spending state. Spending has never driven this problem. Illinois right now, according to the National Association of State Budget Officers, ranks 34th in the nation in spending on services per capita. We have the fifth largest economy and sixth largest population. And we're in the bottom third in spending on education, health, social services, and public safety. That is not a high spending state. I don't care how you slice it. It's just not. And in fact, if you adjust for inflation, 
we are going to be spending less this year on education, health, social services, and public safety. And I mean, seven billion less in real inflation adjusted terms than we did in the year 2000, over two decades ago, under Republican Governor George Ryan. So our big problems in Illinois are structural and long term, and they have to do with the design of our tax policy. And that's always been our big problem. And it has created all these other problems, not just the fiscal system for the state, but the high property taxes and the underfunded pension systems. These really all come out as a result of the structural deficit. Okay, um, big big issue, structural deficit. We'll just pause for a second. Robin. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, are you there? I'm here. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, take it from there. So you know what's going on in the legislature. Uh, Ralph pointed out, a, you know, a real big challenge. There's some positive things there. So how do we how do we turn this around? Obviously, he pointed out the things the governor is going to try and handle $1.3 billion on through these various things, including corporate um, reductions in some ways. Okay. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what else is possible? Well, um, we, from my understanding, we have we had like a three billion dollar deficit starting this budget year. Of that, the way we were going to make that up was half of it was going to come from um, flat spending, and the other half was going to come from these nine hundred million dollars of uh, mostly closing corporate loopholes. Um, it looks good on paper, and as we say, the governor's the first. The governor puts out his budget. And then we start to negotiate. So um, the legislature always has their uh, views on what's what's possible and what's not. Um, you know, part of it, as Ralph mentioned, was to give uh, the local government uh, local governments ten percent uh, less of the money that we normally give them, and uh, that usually doesn't go over very well. Um, local governments are very good at putting a lot of pressure on on legislators, um, but so that's one way to save money. That that the governor proposed that we're just not sure is, is going to happen. Um, the flat set spending that the governor has proposed um, is flat except, and there's some reductions in, uh, in uh, healthcare and uh, family services in the Medicaid program, because initially they thought that that was going to cost a lot more than it did. So the COVID costs that we thought we were gonna incur did not happen. So we have some money in the budget there and then uh, he has increased some funds in Department of Public Health, uh, Department of Children and Family Services, and Department of Human Services, because as we know, COVID has affected our poorest people the most, and those are people who still need help, and as a legislature, we want to still help them. So um, that, that's the proposal, and uh, we'll have to see how, how this plays out. Okay, let me uh, have both you turn. Um, I'm just trying to move it quick because of our time. Um, there's something going on across the country, and it's a very important because it's a it's a legitimate progressive answer to the incredible inequities. Obviously, that anybody that studied things knew, but if they didn't, the pandemic showed them that. Okay, and that relates to what's in in uh, Biden's plan, the 1.9 trillion. Uh, the increasing what you might even call a guaranteed income uh, for people that are not well off, okay? And uh, you've referred to it, Robin, in terms of child credits. Uh, Ralph has referred to it as refundable credits. Uh, what is that all about and why is it so significant? Because um, there's not very many things that are progressive about what we're doing here in Illinois, but this, this could be dramatically important as it is at the federal level when people who've been savaged for decades, savaged by the pandemic, savaged by the economy, may now be walking away in some cases with um, uh, enough to live on uh, for a change. Well, we so hope either so. one of you could pick up on that. I mean, I'll say a little bit about the earned income tax credit and then you can go into more depth, Ralph. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a credit on your taxes. If you, for, for particular people, mostly people who have children, um, and low income wage earners as well. And what it does is if you, it, uh, at a certain level, you will get money back. So you will get a rebate on your taxes. Um, and then if you actually don't owe any taxes, you can also just get a rebate in cash that's sent directly to you to spend. And um, uh, it, it, it's done at the federal level. And then there are a number of states that do it as well. Illinois is one of them 
We have increased it over the years, but there is a push for fairness to, to increase it even more, which means to offer it to more people at more levels and also to uh, provide people with a bigger uh, refund. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna Go ahead, you know, I, I always like um, being on any kind of show with uh, Representative Gable because she's so spot on in, in everything she says. And you're really one of, the, one of the people we have that's one of the good guys in the legislature always has been. So uh, nice job, Robin. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into a little more detail of the economics here because I think this is one of the things that is most poorly covered in, in the general media. And, and so let's, let's talk about how you could actually use tax policy or fiscal policy to stimulate the economy and how you can, and, and what is not something that works to stimulate the economy. I'll start with what doesn't work. Tax breaks for businesses. Tax breaks for businesses do not encourage businesses to hire one more person than they hired before. And then that's not me talking, that's the Congressional Budget Office. It's did a major study of, of even federal tax relief and federal tax policy is far more significant than state tax policy and found no statistically meaningful correlation between providing these tax incentives to businesses to create jobs and actual job creation or economic growth. Now, what's interesting is they did find one thing that did encourage businesses to hire more people. And I hope all of you are seated because this is gonna be very shocking news. Apparently, businesses are hiring more people when they have growing demand for whatever it is they sell. For, uh, apparently, microeconomics actually works. And so if a business needs to expand its capacity to meet demand, it will do that. But if it doesn't, it won't. Now, let's put that in context of a tax break for business. So if, if, if you give a tax break to business, i.e. You're, you're not going to collect from that business taxes they would otherwise owe, why would they create a job with that if there's no growing demand for what they're selling? That would be wasted excess capacity. You know, we're sold this malarkey all the time that if we just cut taxes for business, you know, magically they'll create jobs. And there's never been data to support it. And, and, and the reason there's never been data to support it is it actually runs contrary to the basic principles of microeconomics we all learned in high school, for, for goodness sake. So, so that doesn't work to stimulate the economy. Then there's supply side economics. So let's cut taxes on rich people. That won't stimulate the economy either. Why? Well, what is the economy? And the economy is basically marginal. It's driven by consumer spending, right? It's 68% people buying stuff and junk. That's, that's what it is. Well, if you cut taxes on rich folks, you don't stimulate the economy because they don't spend more. Do you want to know why they don't spend more? I'm going to give you Illinois-specific data. We looked at this. So between 1979 and 2017, and if you want to pull up Tom's slide 21, I think this one's actually worth showing. Between 1979 and 2017, the richest 1% in Illinois saw their average income grow after inflation from $411,000 a year to $1.4 this is Illinois specific data. Then go to the comparison there on the far right. The bottom 99% of earners in Illinois saw their average incomes on an inflation adjusted basis grow from 51,000 to 61,000 over the same period. So if you cut taxes on the really wealthy, they're not gonna spend more because they already have so much growth in income they are spending everything they want. They have very low marginal propensities to consume. Tax breaks for the wealthy do not stimulate the economy because they can't. Now, we're going to talk about things like what Representative Gable brought up, the earned income tax credit, the child tax credit. Tax credits that put more money in the pockets of middle income families end up getting spent in your economy. Why? Look, their, their incomes have been flat on an inflation adjusted basis for 40 years. And in fact, you note that little, that little green language I threw on the top, that's important. While the bottom 99% saw their average income go up, the bottom 90% saw their average incomes go down after inflation. So 90% of the people who are working in Illinois, 
have been seeing declining incomes on an inflation adjusted basis. If you could give them some tax relief or you give them some federal stimulus money, that's what they do. They spend it and they buy crazy things like dry cleaning and groceries and car repairs right there in their local economy. And that creates a very positive economic multiplier. So generally speaking, tax relief that, that goes to low and, and middle income families, for every dollar in that tax relief you get, you get a private sector impact of about a dollar fifty as people take that money and they spend it. And that really creates a lot of economic activity. You provide tax relief to the wealthiest, guess what happens? Nothing. You, you don't get any stimulus from that at all. So the federal stimulus is well designed because most of the relief is targeted to supporting middle income and lower income families. And that's where most of the relief should go. And it will create a stimulus because it will result in additional consumer spending. Now, from a state tax policy standpoint, we have very few tools in the kit, David. You're always key on saying, what can we do that's progressive? And the answer is nothing directly with our tax policy, because literally every tax and fee, and if you don't want to believe me now, then you should all take my master's course at Roosevelt University on budgeting and fiscal policy. We spend an entire three weeks on tax policy. Uh, no tax available to state or local government is progressive. Every tax is regressive. That is, it takes more of the income of a low or moderate earning family than an affluent family. Now, the only tax that could be progressive would be the income tax, but then only if it had a graduated rate structure, which assessed higher tax rates on higher levels of income and lower tax rates on lower levels of income. So that's one of the jobs of the income taxes to build up some progressivity into your tax system. Now, Illinois is stuck with a flat income tax now with, with the, the amendment lost it's referendum. So we are stuck with this flat rate income tax in Illinois. But let me, let me just interrupt there because some of the questions uh, from our audience, um, from I think David uh, uh, Iglo, Nick Fair and others around the fair tax. Oh, and they wanna hear from you or Robin as to, well, not so much why it failed, but um, is there a possibility to be brought back? And I think you just answered one of the questions as well is, is there, any other thing you could do, uh, like the fair tax, to uh, to deal with the income tax that would be different? And the answer is really no. Well, um, no, the, it's the refundable credits, David. So this right, is what you do. Right. This is this is this is the tool we have in our kit. So the way a refundable credit works, and Robin explained it better than I'm going to, but I'm going to re-explain it just because to put it in context. So if you qualify for a $500 income tax credit that's refundable and you only owe $200 in income tax. You don't pay the $200 because 500 is more than 200. And there's a balance of $300 left. You get a check for that. That's the refundability feature. And what that does is it allows you to use your income tax code in this refundable credit to offset other taxes low and middle income earning families pay. So this offsets some of the sales taxes they pay and some of the excise taxes and some of the property taxes. But it does it through this one very convenient and easy to administer methodology. We've got this very short one page income tax return in Illinois. We add a new refundable tax credit. We could literally offset, let's say we have to, we do have to increase our income tax. Let's say we, we increased it from 4.95% to 5.95%. That, that would generate 3.7 billion in net revenue for the state, which is about what the fair tax would have generated. But about 700 million of that's gonna be paid by uh, folks or, or that are earning $50,000 a year or less. We don't want them to pay more. So why not have a refundable credit that wipes out that whole $700 million, goes to those people, make sure they don't pay more in taxes, but we still can collect 3.1, Three three billion in new revenue through that. Couple that with the closure of some of these tax expenditures, and, and that the governor has already put on the table. And now you're starting to talk about ways to build revenue and build some fairness, some progressivity into your system, given the very tough tools in the kit. Uh, uh, Robin, did you want to uh, mention or say something about sure. that? Because I have others for you too. But go ahead. Sure. Sure, just briefly. So I was just going to say that it's unfortunate that our tax system was set up as a flat tax to begin with. 
Um, when I looked into it, it appeared that, that it happened, I think 1970, was it Ralph? Or was it? Yep. And in 1970, we had the least income inequality that we've ever had in this country. So, and we've been going in the, in the direction of more equality. So I think that our policymakers at that time did not imagine that we were then going to start going in the other direction and we were going to have more income inequality. So they passed a fair tax, which um, they thought was fair. They passed a, a, an income tax, which they thought was fair, but we have seen it's not. So, Robin, if um, I might, um, happen again? Do the we old have guy that I am, I would suggest that it wasn't quite that polite. <laughs> Our side got snookered. Their side was organized. The right wingers of the conservatives at that time made it really clear nothing progressive could happen. They wrote it in. And even though I love Don Clark Dutch and the others, we lost and we didn't fight hard enough. And they're always there and they're very good at it. Um, a couple of me throw these things out because we want to get to some of the people's questions. Um, one, um, you know, Tom Tresser is asking about should TIFs be uh, abolished in Illinois? Um, other people are asking about the article in Greg Hines' column, I don't know if you saw it, but it's in Cranes about lowering property taxes and raising the income, the switch that kind of Ralph talked about earlier, uh, because we all know part of the, the unfairness, the lack of equity, the racial connotations, all that is driven at Illinois, right? Because they give so little to the schools compared to other states that we have to play this game of rich communities got bigger property tax, et cetera. Um, and Tom, um, Tom, would you do me a favor? Can you see if you can find um, um, Bob Ginsburg's question somehow? It, it's a good question and I didn't have it right on my sheet here. If you can find Bob's question, uh, we're gonna ask that next. Uh, on any of those, either one of you, Robin or Ralph? You well, want, want to touch the TIF? The TIF thing. So I, we at the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability refer to TIFs, which is tax increment financing, as generally totally irresponsible financing. I mean, there's very little accountability with TIFs. That said, and, and we'd be all for cleaning up TIFs, not necessarily abolishing them. They could play a, an appropriate role in the appropriate situation. Taxing authorities, local taxing authorities, aren't hurt as much by TIFs as people think, because what happens is they still levy whatever they're gonna levy that year subject to PTEL or whatever, and certain property just doesn't pay that levy. So what TIFs really do is they, for the 21 year period, they redistribute tax burden for funding local government uh, in a pretty regressive way, honestly, to other taxpayers and other properties. And, and so that's pretty much uh, what TIFs do. And so they're not a panacea for solving uh, local revenue problems. They, they are very much, to Tom's point, Tom Tresser's point, and he knows a lot about TIFs, they are not very transparent. They are not very accountable. A lot of them are boondoggles and paybacks um, for campaign contributors that are developers and stuff. And so it really needs, I think, substantial reform, but I, I could view a role for a TIF that could be positive if appropriately designed. On property tax swaps, you know, Reverend Senator Meeks, I drafted a bill for him back in the day that would have accomplished a bit of a property tax swap in, in House Bill 750, where you know income taxes would be raised and a portion of that income tax raise would go to offset about $4 billion of property taxes that are currently being paid in Illinois. The problem with doing that now is it may be cost prohibitive because the state's fiscal condition is so bad and the structural deficit is continuing to grow that really the state needs to raise somewhere in the four to six billion dollars of new recurring revenue and probably closer to six to sustainably fund its core services over time on an inflation adjusted basis. And even that's not enough if they don't reamortize the pension debt. We haven't gotten into that yet. But there's other things they have to do. There are no longer any magic silver bullets. So let me just put that in context. Six billion dollar increase in revenue would require, if you just did it from the income tax, you know, a, a full point and a half 
uh, on the income tax. You get to that level and then you want to provide tax relief. So now you need six billion for the state's coffers. How many billions do you need for property tax relief? How high does this rate have to get? And then at some point it gets to the level where the rate is so high, it's not politically feasible. And I think Illinois might be in that place right now. So what I'd much rather see is the state get its fiscal house in order and actually solve the property tax problem by focusing on what caused it. And, and that is the state's failure to fund the K-12 education adequately from state-based re resources. So if we could move, the, if we could generate adequate revenue and over a six to seven year period, eight year period, get Illinois to the point where it's at the national average in the portion of education costs that are being funded for, by the state level. And that means 46% of the cost of education would be paid for by state taxes. Uh, you would see property taxes come down significantly all across Illinois and sustainably. And I, and I think that that's probably the better way to go. It's, it's less of an overall tax increase. It's probably more politically viable, although the state is very conservative when it comes to tax policy, David, you know that. <laughs> Uh, we are we are not and have never been a high tax state. Uh, our total tax burden, state and local, every tax and every fee is a percentage of income. Right now, we rank about 37th in the country. And that's after these last couple of series of tax increases. And so we moved up from like the bottom 10 to, to, to like the bottom third. Woo -hoo. Uh, we're still a very low tax state. And I don't think we'll ever be even a Midland tax state. But you're also so, speaking, speaking objectively, Ralph, and I, I'm not going to get into it, but the level of political mistrust because of the level of corruption yeah. and mismanagement, we, you know, I don't have data to compare that with other states, but it's clearly a factor. Um, let me ask, Tom, did you find Bob Ginsburg's question? I sure did. Uh, you, uh, just... Given the disastrous funding for local governments, how should increases to the state income tax be structured to help cover shortfalls in local government? I think that's it. Well, I'm not surprised it's a great question because Bob Ginsburg is brilliant and he has studied these things. And so, of course, he's going to ask a question that's incredibly on point. So I think uh, at a minimum, we got to go back to the old chair. Uh, on the local government distributive fund. So what do I mean by that? When we passed the temporary tax increase in Illinois on, on the income tax back in 2011, uh, when the state's income tax rate for individuals was bumped up from 3% to 5% on a temporary basis, what they did at the state level was say, we are in such a desperate situation for revenue. And they were at that time, the accumulated deficit in the general fund was nearing 16 billion or more than half of what they were spending on services. So they were in a pretty tough situation. What they did was they said, you know what, we're gonna reduce the share of income tax revenue that we provide down to local governments. They, they did share at about 10% and they cut it down to about 6.7, 6.8%. It's not the percentage that matters. What they really did was said, we're gonna hold local governments to the same level of revenue sharing as if the income tax rate was still 3%. So they shared in none of the growth. And they, they've kept that model since that time. Uh, and, and in, um, in the last few years, at least three or four times, they didn't even fund the full local government distributive fund statutory amount. They prorated it, 86% uh, one year, 92% one year, 90% another year. So local governments have just not shared in the income tax revenue at the same rate as they used to before Illinois started messing around with its income tax rates. And why that's so pernicious at the local government level, think about education funding as I've discussed it today. So now we know property taxes are high because local school districts are forced to really overextend the property tax so that they could educate kids because the state's not bearing its fair share there. Well, the property tax should be the main revenue source available to fund municipalities and local governments. But now you have schools taking a bigger chunk of that revenue base to fund education because of the state's failure to fund education. So municipalities have, have, have had taken away from them a portion of the revenue base that should be there 
And then, okay, the state said, well, we'll make up for that a little bit by sharing our income tax revenue. Now we're cutting that. So municipalities are sort of getting whacked in both senses. And that's really unfair. It makes it very difficult for local governments to balance their budget. Uh, um, if we went back to the old sharing ratio on the, the local government distributive fund, for instance, the city of Chicago would realize uh, over $250 million for their budget overnight. So it, it's, it's a very meaningful amount of money for local governments. And I think, Bob, that's a great question. And it's one that really should be in the overall fiscal policy discussion when the state talks about its condition, because the, the, the state's fiscal system and its fiscal problems very much flow downhill to local governments. I, I want to ask, and unless uh, I was going to ask about three other issues that people are talking about, uh, and we can't go into detail, we'd like to, uh, but let me mention those three. One is sales tax. She'll be expanding the sales tax because remember, Illinois, um, well, basically, Illinois is going the wrong direction. Okay. They don't expand it to many other products that other states do. So they're actually bringing in less. Okay, so one is sales tax. Uh, two is the transaction tax that um, many of our more progressive friends talk about on a regular basis, meaning LaSalle, et cetera. And the third one um, is uh, an interesting situation in Illinois, particularly where um, if you have a nice pension, particularly a government pension, um, like I know I'm picking on judges because I think judges make $203,000 a year, uh, which means they get a pension about 180 some thousand dollars a year. And in Illinois, they pay no taxes on that. And the tens of thousands of government workers that make over $100,000, uh, and there are that many, um, none of those people pay anything on that. Now, to protect ourselves, of course, from all of our friends in labor and so forth, um, if one was saying you should pay for some of that, if you exempt the first 50,000, you take care of about 85% of all workers who get pensions. Um, anyway, let me just, uh, those three different ideas. So we don't tax pensions. The transaction tax is often brought in as a way to, quote, um, rein in the rich. Um, it, it wouldn't pass, but it's something that's being talked about. Um, and the sales tax. So Robin, do you want to? Sure. <laughs> Sure. I'll say, <laughs> I'm combining various questions here. So, so I'll, I'll say a few words about the sales tax and the uh, uh, retirement tax income. So in terms of the sales tax, I think that when we look at how our economy is structured, for years, our economy was mostly goods and serve goods, and now it's mostly services, and we only tax the goods. So we're really not taxing a lot of our economy and what goes on in our economy. So I, I do think that taxing some services is a great idea. I think it would bring in more revenue. I think it would be more fair. Um, but, you know, in Springfield, when we start to talk about taxing new services, there's like five pages of lists. And then everybody goes through it and say, well, you can't tax that. Well, you can't tax that. What? So it would have to be a, a really strong effort by, uh, by, by everyone to be able to move into taxing some services. But, but I think but it before, makes sense. Before you leave that, Robin, though, is there an appetite? I mean, uh, we all know how it goes. Yeah, don't, uh, don't gore my ox or whatever it is. But <laughs> is there a real appetite for leadership from the Democrats in Springfield on this? You know, there's some. It all, we, it all depends on what, what our other options are. If our other options are cutting services in uh, meals on wheels for the elderly, for a community care program where they go take care of people in their homes, it all, you know, you have to balance it. So it all depends on what our options are. Okay. Um, so that, uh, and then I was just going to mention on the, um, on the retirement, taxing retirement income, um, you know, we looked at it. We looked at just taxing the people who earn more than $50,000 a year. And as you said, 85% people earn less. So it really only taxes a few. And from my understanding, and we can always look at it again, was that it really, it didn't bring in enough money to be worth the political push on it. So. Yeah, I, I've certainly heard that, but I just wanna remind everybody, there's thousands and thousands of people who get $150,000, $180,000 every year in their pensions, and it's going up 3% every year 
and they pay no tax to the state of Illinois. So uh, I'm, I'm frankly personally less concerned about how much it makes for the state. I'm sure some folks out there could do some pretty quick math about the number of meals on wheels and other things that you could, and rent assistance and others that you could do with that money. But okay, thank you. Um, did you want to touch on the transaction yes. tax, Ralph? Well, well, it, it doesn't make sense at the state level. It, it's a it's a federal program. I would literally volunteer to write the legislation for the federal government and then set up a revenue sharing program for the states, much like under that progressive leftist president, uh, Richard Nixon, that we had uh, a long time ago. I, I think that that's something that should happen at the state level. It's 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 difficult and not the best tax policy for a number of reasons. I want to emphasize Robin's exactly right on on expanding the sales tax base. Can you, uh, Tom, can you pull up slide 23 real quick? I'm going to give the numbers that Robin kind of threw out here. So it, there are 45 states in America that have a sales tax and Illinois taxes fewer services than any other state, few, less of the modern economy. We have the lowest, uh, the smallest tax base. So the red bar here shows you the percentage of the Illinois economy made up by the sale of products over time hard physical things you could touch. This is what we taxed. It was 40% of our economy in 1965. It's down to 17%. Services, what we don't tax, has grown to be 73% of our economy. You just can't leave the largest and fastest growing segment of your economy out of your tax base and, and expect to be able to balance your books. Our, our tax revenue doesn't grow with the modern economy because frankly, we're not taxing the modern economy. And there's actually some Republican support for doing this. Uh, so I think that that's an interesting thing to note. And if we just tax the exact same consumer services as they tax in neighboring Iowa and Wisconsin, $2 billion in revenue. So you add that with a with a point or a point and a half increase on the income tax and or these tax expenditures. And you've pretty much got a revenue package that takes care of uh, the state's revenue needs. Then you just have to deal with re-amortizing the pension debt. I don't think we're gonna have time to get into that tonight. And, uh, and, and that deserves a whole separate conversation. But literally, Illinois has the most narrow tax base when it comes to the sales tax of any state in America. And we gotta fix that problem. I wanna make sure I heard that right. Are you saying if we only did what Iowa and what other state? Wisconsin. And Wisconsin did, those conservative Republican states to a certain degree, um, our revenue could go up $2 billion? $2 billion at the state. Mm -hmm. And for the, once again, municipalities, which piggyback on the state sales tax base, would all get an increase in revenue. And so this is something that would really help the fiscal system, not just of the state of Illinois, but local governments. And it would it would align our tax policy better with the modern economy. I mean, you can't you can't really raise adequate revenue in the modern economy if you don't tax where the modern economy is growing. And we simply don't do that. And Robin mentioned one thing that I think is a really crucial point. That's why I love doing programs with Representative Abel. She's always so spot on. But it's slightly more progressive if you have a broader base to your sales tax and you tax more services than one that focuses on products, it's still a regressive tax. It's still going to take more of the income of a low or moderate earner than of an affluent earner, but affluent folks' consumption patterns involve a lot more services and low and moderate income folks buy more products. And the classic example that's used is the woman who's uh, running her household in Peoria, buys a lawnmower to take care of her lawn and pays a sales tax on it. And the financier who lives in Barrington hires a lawn service and pays no sales tax on that lawn service. And so it is slightly more progressive, even though it's still a regressive tax, it's a, it's a better way to go. And, and this is something that's difficult to say on a, on a on a, a group like this that's very concerned about being progressive, but it's the truth when you crunch the numbers. If it's a choice between raising revenue regressively or cutting spending on services, the better thing to do for low-income families is raise the revenue every single time. Because the loss of services, I mean, and let's just not talk about the long-term damage caused to kids by underfunding their education, right? Let's talk about losing your child care support. Let's talk about losing your domestic violence treatment center. Let's 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 talk about 
having overstaffed DCFS workers that can't really care for the abused and neglected kids. I mean, the bottom line is the economic and other damage caused the low and moderate earning families from a loss of, of investment in service is always far greater than the additional cost imposed on them through a regressive tax. I say, you know, the better thing to do is raise the revenue and then try to find some ways to build progressivity into your tax policy. Like for instance, using some of these refundable credits, creating a new one specifically designed to target relief to let's say uh, people earning under $75,000 a year. We just put out a report a couple of weeks ago showing how uh, we could raise some revenue from the income tax and hold harmless literally everyone earning $75,000 a year or less in Illinois. And that's that's about 76 or 77 percent of our taxpayers. So that's the vast majority of folks in the state wouldn't pay more in taxes. Yeah, are you uh, trying to float that to the governor? We are always trying to float these things to the governor. We sent it out to every elected official. I'm Robin, I'm sure you got our email with the report. Uh, so yes, we, one thing we're not, David, is shy. Good, good. Hey, now I'm gonna do something the opposite of what you just said, because we have a question about, um, from uh, Steve Tomlinson about how to, uh, what, what made plans to address our underfunded pensions. Now I know it's difficult, Okay, it's not the most responsible thing to do because we don't have a lot of time. But the National News every night talks about extraordinarily complicated things and they give us six seconds. Okay, and it really ticks me off. So let's take a little longer. And I know it's complicated. Uh, is it fair to say that what your answer would be, Ralph, I understand, right, is you would change the amortization of how we pay the. Yeah, pain. so I, I'm sorry, Tom, I'm going to make you work more, but. Actually, I'm not really that sorry. You're, you're a nice young guy. You know technology. You can work. Pull up slide 16. You, you can provide that now. <laughs> okay. I, just, I just want to say one thing about the pension, which we oftentimes forget, and that is that we changed the pension package for employees starting uh, who were hired after uh, January 1st of 2011. So our problem here is time limited. Yeah, so this is the pension ramp, guys. You add these two bars together, the little pink bar and the big blue bar, and that's the total payment required to go into the pension system every year under the 1995 pension ramp. Now, why did I break it out? But to highlight the point Robin just made, see that little pink bar? That's the normal cost of funding the benefits actually being earned by current workers and will be earned by future workers. See how that's going down? And see what a small part of that is of the pension payment? If all we were funding is the normal cost of the benefits being earned, no one would be talking about a pension problem. It'd be a $2 billion payment. It'd be nothing. The blue bar is the responsible plan for repaying what was borrowed from the pension systems. Does that look responsible to you? That is what's crushing the state. And, and that is what's growing by 700 million, 800 million on a year to year basis, way outstripping rates of growth and in inflation, way outstripping uh, anything our revenue system could produce. So when you say, David, re-amortize the debt, that just means refinance it and refinance it in a, in a manner that makes some sense. So if you just go to the very next slide, Tom. But I hope this for one slide here makes it clear, pension benefits ain't driving this problem, folks. <laughs> All right, this red line going across this graphic here, that is the pension ramp. So that's the same graph you just saw before, but expressed in a line. The light green light bars are how we'd re-amortize the payment. This would be the new payment. Instead of paying what the red line says, we would have taxpayers cover what that light greenish bar looks like it covers. And then the dark green bars are additional money we put into the pension systems by issuing pension obligation bonds until the state had enough recurring revenue to meet its obligations here. So what does this all do? It flattens out the pension payment. So instead of it increasing every single year, it's a level dollar amount of debt amortization. The reason it goes down over time is because the cost of funding benefits is going down. The debt service stays flat, just like your home mortgage. 
hopefully you don't have a home mortgage that jumps every year by a few thousand dollars in payment, right? You wouldn't agree to that. Your bank wouldn't agree to that. So this puts it more like a mortgage. The other thing it does is it, it, it really brings the state's pension systems to health by the end of fiscal year 2045. So as of now, our pension systems are roughly 38% funded. That means they have 38% of the assets they should have. According to the General Accounting Office in Washington, D.C., a system should have 80% of the assets it's supposed to have to be healthy, a public system. This plan would get these pension systems from where they are today, 38% funded, to 72% funded by the year 2045. And then after that, you could get them 100% funded in the next 30 years. And literally, the very next year, the payment would go way down to be about two to $3 billion a year, just way down. Now, the, the repayment of the pension debt that you see included in the light green bars includes repaying the pension obligation bonds that are issued up front. And we wouldn't issue a giant pension obligation bond in one year, we'd issue them over a series of years so you don't have market timing concerns, et cetera, et cetera. But issuing those bonds is a great way to save taxpayers money in a couple of different ways. Way number one, instead, this isn't new debt, right? Instead of owing this debt to the pension systems, the state would now owe the debt to bondholders and we take the proceeds from the bonds and put them into the pension systems. So why that's good for taxpayers, the interest rate we pay on debt we owe to the pension systems varies from 6.75% to 7.5%, depending on the pension system. The interest rate we would pay on these taxable bonds would be anywhere between three and a half to five and a half percent. In other words, less. So right up front, we're gonna pay less upfront interest cost out of pocket. That saves money in your current budget. Uh, but what used to be debt we owe to the pension system, say in the first year, it's a $2 billion bond. That $2 billion it now becomes an asset for the pension system that starts developing a return as it gets invested, saving taxpayers money. So net, 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 doing this program, we would get the state's pension system 72% funded and cost taxpayers $45 billion less than the pension rate. Now that's 45 billion you don't have to raise in taxes or 45 billion you don't have to cut in spending on services while still getting the pension systems to a very close to being healthy. And then you have these next 30 years at a much lower annual cost to get there. It takes okay, all so the let, pressure off the system. Let yeah. me ask as maybe the final question. Okay, um, you've been peddling this Ralph and you're brilliant. And um, to a lot of people, this makes a lot of sense. Why is neither the legislature or govern governor apparently interested in this solution? Well, the legislature has been. So, I mean, Melinda Bush has put in this legislation for us uh, more than one time. So has State Representative Carol Ammons, uh, Kim Lightford, Will Davis have supported it. Uh, in the last year of the Rauner administration, uh, Bob Pritchard, a Republican state rep, had pulled together about 14 or 15 Republican legislators and the governor's asset support. And then the governor pulled his support at the last minute and for political reasons. And so we lost the Republicans, lost the momentum. So I think it's more a question of convincing the Pritzker administration. Now the Pritzker administration did their first year in office, put on the table a reamortization of pension debt. And unfortunately, all they did was lower the payments every single year, but still extend them out with a big ramp. And so the rating agencies like Moody's and stuff said, no, you're just kicking the can down the road. The state still can't afford it. So they got beat up for doing that. And, and I think that's made them a little gun shy about going after it again. They're worried about what the rating agencies, et cetera, would say. But interestingly enough, you know, we have a, a, a report done by Moody's in like 2011 that basically says, if you're gonna do a reamortization, we're not gonna support it unless it has these characteristics. And literally every one of the characteristics lists is in the reamortization plan that we've put on the table. It's a very responsible not kick the can down the road. It actually increases the funded ratio of the pension systems. In other words, gets them healthier fiscally faster than the pension ramp does. The pension ramp doesn't 
do a better job until way out years when the payments are increasing, you know, by, you know, billion and a half a year. So it's it I think it's got some political viability. It challenges David and and you know this is a challenge you, you've also taught policy and stuff. This is one of those solutions that provides long-term benefits with no short-term gains. Uh, political systems generally don't respond well to fixing long-term problems if they can't claim a short-term benefit. And 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 so you really need leadership you need politicians that are, are really willing to take that long-term view. We've had a number of them that we've gotten close. We're going to keep on it. We will see. Yeah, no, I think that this is a good plan, Ralph, because it does not kick it down the road and it keeps it at 2045. I mean, I still think it's a little unfair that this generation has to burden, take the whole burden for all the uh, decades of years that they didn't pay into that other generations didn't pay into it because as you know in 2046 uh, it's going to drop from 10 billion or 9 billion to 2 billion yeah so it's still not exactly fair but i think that it's probably necessary based on the on moody's and the concept of not kicking the can down the road yeah. it's an uphill battle given americans trying to live by the toilet assumption don't do anything until it backs up. Um, so um, I want to thank both of you a great deal. Uh, and I want to apologize to, we don't know what happened. We'll, Tom and I will talk about it later. Um, people so desperately trying to get in something about the code, whatever. But uh, for those of you who did make it great and um, those who maybe missed something, uh, Tom will explain. This will be on uh, Facebook uh, if you want to. So again, we thank you all. We, um, uh, one little um, action we want to encourage people because partly we deal with ethics and accountability. Um, and we're very concerned, and Robin knows this, that there's been ethics legislation in Springfield um, that would preempt everywhere else. And it would mean Chicago's great strides in controlling lobbyists and so forth would be out the window. Um, so just keep that in mind, um, among other things that we'll be dealing with in the future. We certainly don't want to have what Chicago has done and what Cook County is trying to do, and hopefully will pass the next month or so, uh, be thrown out by a state law that would say you can't do that. Um, now, we don't hope that'll happen, but I want you all to know that it's, uh, I think it's maybe still in the legislation, I'm not sure. Um, we'll address that later, but uh, thank you all. Um, back to you, Tom. Any closing things here? Uh, no, just uh, to echo what David said, thank you all. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, we will be sending out, uh, we've recorded this, so if you missed part of the, the virtual town hall, uh, make sure to pay attention to our email. We'll send out uh, a link to, we'll put it on our website and send out a link so you can watch the full thing. Uh, and we also went live on Facebook, so it's it's on our Facebook page as well. So uh, be sure to go to goodgovernmentillinois.com and sign up for our, our newsletter if you haven't already. Uh, and let's hear it for our, our guests, Ralph and Robin. <laughs> From home. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, David. Thank you, Thank Ralph. You. Thank you, everyone, for coming, all my friends out there. Thank you.